We'll talk about two different types of warm-ups, a general warm-up and a sports-specific warm-up. So a true warm-up should probably be a combination of the two things. So a general warm-up, all that means is you get moving. So you start to move the body in larger movements. You're gradually increasing your range of motion. You're doing general movements. So let's say your goal is to play basketball you, you know you start off walking and then jogging a little bit doing range of motion activities so arm circles you know knee lifts gradually preparing your body for basketball or whatever activity you're doing so it's general movements that are appropriate for any exercise um, we are noting right here that static stretching during the warm-up does not um, reduce injury rate so we used to do a warm-up and at the end of the warm-up we would have people do a static stretch, so a stretch where they hold the stretch. We don't do that anymore. Uh, the reason being is it was shown that it doesn't actually increase injury risk. And arguably, it can, by doing static stretching, can decrease our power output. So athletes that require more power, um, that'll decrease. But, but the biggest reason is, is there was no benefit. We do dynamic stretching during the warm-up. Dynamic stretching will be just simply a large range of motion. So, you know, doing arm circles, doing um, dynamic lunges back and forth, doing dynamic kind of movements that increase the range of motion. We don't stop and hold a stretch. Um, stopping and holding a stretch will also let our heart rate drop down. So if we're doing cardiovascular, that would be counterproductive. The only real exception for doing static stretching during a warm-up are activities that require a large amount of flexibility. So uh, dancers, gymnasts, divers, figure skaters, they would choose to do dynamic, or sorry, static stretching because their activity would require it. But the majority of us don't. So we do start off with that general warm-up and then we actually progress. So we'll progress to sports specific. So a sports specific warm-up will do drills that mimic their sports performance. And it'll be rehearsal of the activity. So going back to my basketball um, example, so as they get out, they start running, they run some laps, they might do some high knees, some like lunges, some shoulder rolls, arm circles. That was their general warm up. Then they go sports specific. So now all of a sudden they might start practicing some layups. They might get a ball out. They might start dribbling the ball as they're doing their warm up. In a fitness class, if I'm teaching a choreographed fitness class, I might have them just do very basic moves to warm up, but then I'll start to get more specific at the end of it. So I'll slowly start to increase the pace and I'll start to really rehearse the activity. The example they give here and in your textbook, they talk about resistance training. So uh, resistance training, I might have the individual warm up on a treadmill for a few minutes. So they're walking on the treadmill or biking on a, tr uh, not biking on a bicycle, pardon me, they won't bike on a treadmill, but they might do some biking. That would be general. And then I might move them to the wo um, weight room and I might have them lift the weights, lifting light weights, rehearsing their actual lifts. So if they do a 150 pound um, bench press, then their warm up, I might have them warm up using just the bar. Okay, so that would be sports specific. You will always sort of go from general to sports specific. So the next component of a fitness class usually will opt to go from doing the warm-up into the cardiovascular conditioning right away and then l follow with the resistance training. This is not an absolute rule, but truthfully, it does flow a lot better because during my warm-up, my heart rate gets up. It leads me into that cardiovascular versus if I warm up and then I stop, I do my resistance training, then I need to kind of re-warm up to get cardiovascular, to get that heart rate back up to the cardiovascular. So usually we will put cardiovascular first. During this session, um, this session should last at least 20 minutes if that's what we're training for. So you've already done a warm-up, you want a minimum of 20 minutes. You want to make sure that it's moderate to vigorous physical activity. So moderate to vigorous. So you're going to instruct your participants on using either heart rate or rates of perceived exertion. They need to make sure it's worth their while, that the intensity is there. And we want to make sure that it's sustained activity. When we talk about cardiovascular endurance and cardiovascular health, we measure this by VO2 max. So it's the volume of oxygen maximum, so maximum oxy oxygen consumption. Or in other words, the volume of oxygen that the body can utilize per kilogram of body weight for each minute of activity. 
So what that means is that uh, whenever we are doing activity, our body will require oxygen to fuel that activity. As we become more and more fit, we, can, we will be able to do more movement and more activity per minute, which will require more and more oxygen. So as we keep getting fitter, we need more oxygen as we work at that higher intensity because the intensity is increasing until we reach what we call our VO2 max. So the maximum rate of oxygen consumption by the muscles. So that would be a measurement of how hard the muscles can actually work. So there's different ways. Um, you could go and find multiple ways of measuring VO2 max. However, the most accurate way is actually done in a lab and they will usually have you on a treadmill. Sometimes some of the tests will be a bike. They're graded tests that become gradually more difficult the longer you do the test and they usually strap you up to machines to measure the amount of oxygen and carbon dioxide that you're utilizing and expelling. So things that control how much or how high your VO2 max can get will be things such as your age. So as we age after a certain point, our VO2 max will naturally decline with age. So once we become an adult, as we get older beyond being an adult, so once beyond our 20s, our VO2 max will decrease per year. Our gender, so men will have a higher um, oxygen consumption. Uh, body composition will make a difference as well as the state of training. So the fitter you are, the higher of a VO2 max score you will have. So the fitter you are, the more intensive activity you can do per minute that would require more oxygen per minute. So your VO2 max score would be higher. As well as the mode of exercise can also affect what your oxygen consumption is. So if you're doing something that you're not very efficient at, then you might um, end up maxing out at a lower VO2 max. So mode of exercise can play a role. So training our hardi cardiovascular system is important and there are certain benefits from doing cardiovascular or aerobic activity, so long sustained activity of the large muscle groups. With training our heart will pump more efficiently. So our heart is a pump and whenever we are exercising our heart will fill up with blood and then the heart will contract sending that blood around the body or to the lungs. So remember we talked about the different chambers. So with training our heart becomes more efficient. So that means that um, it could fill with more blood for each heartbeat. So with each heartbeat it sends more blood out into the body. So think about this as like a bicycle pump. Even though it's a bicycle pump is not a closed system. You'll still give you an idea of how this would work. That if you did these tiny little pumps on the bicycle pump, so like little half pumps, you'd have to do a whole bunch of them really, really fast, right, to blow something up, okay? You have to do a whole bunch of them really quickly. Or you could take big, large pumps of the bicycle pump, okay? So going through a large range of motion, big, large pump, and that's going to allow more air out with each pump. That is how it works with our heart. And in fact, the amount of blood that we eject with each beat is called our stroke volume. As we become more fit, our heart is more efficient. So our ventricles will hold more blood. So when that heart contracts effectively and efficiently, it will send out more blood to the body. So our stroke volume increases. Our cardiac output, which is how much blood is circulated in the body, is a combination of stroke volume and heart rate. So how much blood we send through the body is a combination of how much blood is sent out with each beat and how many beats we have per minute. If our heart is not efficient, so if that stroke volume is low and it does not send very much blood with each beat, our heart rate has to be higher. So you'll have more, you'll have a higher heart rate because you're sending out more blood, or sorry, you're sending out less blood with each beat. So once again, picture that bicycle pump, you're doing these tiny little kind of ineffective little pumps, okay? With training, that stroke volume increases, and as a result, our heart rate decreases. We don't have to do as many um, beats per minute using the 
uh, bike pump analogy, all of a sudden, if you do those big full pumps with a bike bicycle tire pump, right? If you do these big full pumps, you don't have to do as many to fill up the tire. Okay, so it's it's very very similar. So, the heart will become able to pump more efficiently, and because the heart and the heart as a result will pump more blood per beat. And we say that is your stroke volume increases. Okay, we call that stroke volume. Because your stroke volume increases, your heart rate at rest will be lower. Also, your heart rate at sub-maximal exercise will be less. So your maximal heart rate won't change, but your sub-maximal. So that would be when you go for a walk. So let's say you're going for a walk and you're not very conditioned and just a regular walk. This is sub-maximal um, exercise. It's not maximal effort your heart's going to beat. It's going to have to beat at a higher rate, a higher frequency, if you're not very trained because your stroke volume will be low. So your heart's going to go quite high just to do that walk. As you become more fit, your stroke volume increases. So while doing submaximal exercise, so that same walk, if you keep the walk at the same speed, your heart rate will be lower because you won't have to have the heart beat as often. Other things that will happen is you will actually increase your number of red blood cells. It's RBC, red blood cells. And your total blood volume will also increase. Blood supplies to your tissues increase. And this increases because you get an increased capillary network. So remember when we went to from arteries to arterioles to capillaries? Capillaries is where gas exchange occurs. And once the body perceives a need to increase the amount of gas exchange occurring at the muscle, it is going to build more capillary networks, so more capillaries so that there'll be more oxygen exchange. So the increased capillary network to increase the blood supply to the tissue. Your resting blood pressure will also decrease, as well as having increased lung efficiency. So these are all really heart healthy benefits to doing cardiovascular training. So the FIT formula you're going to see some variation in numbers. I know that earlier we are talking three to five. Here it's saying about three to six times per week. We want to make sure we do cardiovascular training frequently. The higher the intensity, the less frequently we need to do it. But for the most part, yes, anywhere two to six, or three to six, five or three to six times per week. Intensity is recommended to be moderate to vigorous intensity. A beginner will start at moderate. As they become more advanced, we shift them more to vigorous. Time, when we're structuring a class, we're talking about 20 minutes minimum per class or longer. And type, we really do want to focus on weight-bearing aerobic activities. So we're going to be doing walking, jogging, aerobic classes. Um, we want to do that weight-bearing activity because weight-bearing activity is going to increase the strength of our bones. So how can we do cardiovascular training? Um, the most common way and the most appropriate way for a beginner is going to be continuous training. So you will warm up the individual following the rules of the warm up and then you will maintain approximately the same intensity for the entire duration of the class. So you're not fluctuating. That is in contrast to interval training. So interval training will be at a higher and lower intensities during a single training session. Now, this doesn't have to be high intensity interval training. I could work comfortably in my aerobic zone, but I could fluctuate to a higher intensity, lower intensity. So it's sort of wave like. Um, you'll use this a lot in spin classes or um, kind of group kind of training classes where you're doing something less intense and then you pick up the pace. You could do this as well with running where you might be jogging and then you might do mini sprints to get that interval training. This, and, and it, when you are working with beginners, we limit interval training at the beginning. And then when we do start to add in um, interval training, we keep that intensity still on the lower side. So you could still do an interval on a lower intensity. It's that high intensity stuff that's um, perceived as usually a little bit more negative by beginners. Circuit training, what that is, is it's going to be a series of exercise stations. So this will often happen in uh, sports conditioning classes, 
Uh, there's different types of gyms that will also set up where you have a series of stations. And as long as you're having aerobic stations in there as well, this can serve as aerobic conditioning as well. We could also do circuit training with resistance training. So perhaps you sit at a chest press machine and then you go to a leg press machine. You circuit all the way through. We could simply add in aerobic conditioning. So I'll frequently teach classes where I'll have them do uh, push-ups, seated row, um, squats, and then maybe I'll have them do jumping jacks, so something to get that heart rate up. So that would be circuit training. And finally, cross training. This is um, where you would just choose different activities. And you could do this between exercise sessions. So maybe one day you run, one day you bike, or you could do it within. So perhaps you, this, the individual is um, in a weight facility or like a, a gym facility. You might have them do treadmill for 10 minutes and then bike for 10 minutes and then elliptical for 10 minutes. Or I've taught a multitude of classes that were half high-low, half step aerobics. Right, so some sort of circuit training, change up the stressor, keeps the interest up, and once again, it also um, prevents overuse um, injuries. So resistance training. So resistance training is the moment we add a resistance. So this could be body weight, this could be dynaband or tubing, this could be dumbbells or kettlebells or any kind of weighted um, item. So uh, when you look at a complete program for training, you have to be including resistance training. It does not have to be within the same workout as aerobic training and cardiovascular, but a program should have a minimum of two days a week of resistance training. That's what the Canadian Physical Activity Guidelines recommends is resistance training exercises two days or more. Little terminology, I've already used some of this before. Um, we use the repetitions and sets. So reps are described the number of times you perform an exercise. So I do squats and I'm doing 10 repetitions. That means I do 10 squats. So I do 10 squats or 10 repetitions. Sets are the number of cycles of repetitions completed. So if I do three sets of 10 repetitions, that would mean I would do 10. I would rest. And remember, when we were talking strength training, we talked about two minutes or more. When we talked about endurance training, one to two minutes usually. So I will rest. And then I will do a second set. So I'll do 10 repetitions again. I shall rest. And then because I said I prescribed three sets, I would do that third set of 10 repetitions. We've mentioned muscular strength and muscular endurance. So muscular strength is, by definition, the amount of force you could generate um, the maximal amount of force you could generate in a single contraction, whereas muscular endurance is the ability to maintain a submaximal effort over time. So muscular strength could be lifting like in real life examples. It could be like lifting um, heavy groceries or lifting children or walking upstairs or hitting a tennis ball like really hard or riding up. A, if you increase your muscular strength, it'll be easier to ride a bike uphill. Muscular endurance, that could be like walking for a um, distance of time, repeatedly swinging it. This could be also doing yard work or repeatedly doing things. So maximal st or strength, you think of few repetitions. Endurance, you think of several repetitions. So general guidelines when it comes to uh, programming for resistance training, when we create programs, it's important that you include concentric, eccentric, and isometric movements. So we would do an arm curl, we would do the up phase of the concentric and the down phase as the eccentric, and we could also do isometric contractions in there as well. We really do isometric a lot with the core body, but there should be a combination. In general, we do sequence large muscle groups for small muscle groups in a program. So we would be choosing to work the chest, back, and legs first, and then the biceps, triceps, and calves second. Large muscle groups before small muscle groups. That also holds true that we would be um, doing a multi-joint exercise before a single joint. So a multi-joint is going to be any exercise that requires more than one joint to move. So if I think about chest exercise, doing a push-up is a multi-joint exercise because movement occurs at my elbow and my shoulder. So it's a multi-joint. A single joint could be a chest fly 
or a pec deck exercise where I keep my elbow rigid and it's slightly bent but it doesn't move and from there I move only at the shoulder that would be a single joint and so normally we progress multi joint to single joint and then we like to do the high intensity exercises first before the lower intensity so while we are more fresh we're going to do higher intensity so the heavier weight or potentially the more explosive exercises first and then the lower intensity after. If you take the resistance training uh, module, that will explain this all in a lot more detail. I do know that there are multiple exceptions to these general rules of the large muscle groups for small muscle groups. So advanced individuals might do that backwards, but the general rule is large before small, multi-joint before single joint. There's a minimal standard for resistance training that you want to do a minimum of one set. Okay, so obviously that means you simply did something. So the, the standard is one set of 8 to 12 repetitions. If you're an older adult or less conditioned, they usually tend to do 10 to 15 repetitions, which means the intensity of the exercise is less. So they're lifting lighter weights. And when you're programming, you're going to be choosing making a program that has 8 to 10 exercises. So one exercise for all the major muscle groups. So you would do, um, for example, you would do a chest press, a seated row to work the back, squats for the legs, uh, bicep curls for the biceps, tricep extensions for the triceps. You would do a shoulder press for the anterior delt posterior fly for the posterior deltoid, uh, then calf raises and lunges. That would give you nine different exercises in that example, and that would work the full body. So that's your eight to ten exercises, all major muscle groups included. Training frequency, if we are a novice or a beginner in this case, you would want to exercise two to three days per week. Once you become more intermediate or advanced, we exercise and train more days of a week of the week. However, we now start to do a split program. So a split program would be that if you're exercising five days a week, maybe you do upper body, lower body, upper body, lower body, right? So you're not doing the full body workout every single day. Because remember, we want to make sure that we're letting muscles recover for about 48 hours. So we're going to have to do a split program. And sometimes they do um, split programs fancier. They might do um, front versus back. So all your pushing versus your pulling exercises. Um, advanced bodybuilders will break it down even farther where they will do chest one day, back one day, arms and shoulders one day, legs one day. Okay, so you could break it down different ways. As you become more advanced, you do a split program. Other general guidelines is if you're going for hypertrophy, so remember hypertrophy is the increase in muscle mass. So this is getting bigger muscles is what we're trying to do. Hypertrophy, larger muscles. The general rule for hypertrophy is you need a higher volume workout. So higher volume means you did more lifts. So these individuals will tend to work usually around that 8 to 12 rep range and they will do multiple, multiple sets. They'll be doing four to six sets per muscle group. They'll do multiple exercises per muscle group. So they're doing a lot of work for hypertrophy. Um, that's one of the biggest things that will cause a change is the amount of work that you do. Muscular endurance. So we, we mentioned what to do for muscular endurance. So it should be noted now that muscular endurance are multi-joint exercises or full body exercises. So you do not do muscle endurance of arm curls. You know, you wouldn't do that. You could do muscle endurance of a row pattern or a press pattern, but you don't isolate muscles with muscle endurance. So once again, same sort of the same sort of things we've talked about. So just remembering that fit principle. So the fit formula, frequency, intensity, time and type. So muscular strength is going, the intensity is going to be high. So it's going to be 85 to 100% of one rep max. And in this they're saying one to five sets. Muscle endurance is going to be one to three sets. The resistance is going to be lower, usually 50 to 70%. Repetitions will be high. So time, you can look at time multiple ways with the resistance training. In this example, they're using time as per your rest. So they're talking about how much rest. If you're doing muscular strength, you want more rest in between. So two minutes plus. If you're doing um, endurance, you're going to want less rest. So usually one to two minutes. 
Other ways to think of time is the number of repetitions, so muscular strength is going to be very high intensity, so we'll do low repetitions. So you would have less time. And then type, so what did you do? What was the exercise? What kind of equipment did you use? And like I said, we could use dumbbells and barbells and machines and kettlebells and weighted balls. We could use cables. Um, I don't know if I said machines, if I didn't say machines and Dynaband, those should be on there too. So our intensity is based, as we've said, on the one repetition max, so the maximal amount of weight you can lift one single time. So it is outside the scope of most of our certifications to test for one repetition max. Uh, that's usually left to those that have degrees in um, kinesiology or, or exercise science. So what we would do instead is we would do predictions for one repetition max. So what I would have an individual do is I would know what the exercise I, want, exercise I wanted them to do. I would have them adequately warm up and then I would have them estimate how much weight they could lift. So I want them to do 10 repetitions and they might guesstimate oh, I could probably do 50 pounds at that. So they try and if they're successful then I let them rest and we increase the, we the weight, we re increase the resistance, and then we'll try again. And I want to go until the point is that they can get, they can reach a point, pardon me, where they can't do any more. So if I was to do uh, 10 repetitions, I could not do an 11th repetition. Like I just absolutely could not lift with proper form one more time. And that would be my 10 rep max number. That would give me 10 rep max number, how much weight that was. You can then use a multitude of um, equations or there's actually online charts that you simply would look and go, how much weight did you lift for 10 repetitions? And it will estimate your one rep max. So it'll say, I'm, and I'm completely making these numbers up right now, but if you could lift, um, actually I could probably estimate. So if you could lift say 80 pounds for eight repetitions, it would estimate your one rep max to be around 100 pounds. So that is how this, this will work, okay? Um, it has to be proper form, and if you find that you go through about four or about five sets and you still haven't reached the point that you wouldn't be able to lift more weight, so, that, so as you keep increasing, you should probably have the individual stop and rest and then come back another day because what's going to happen is simply by doing so many sets, they're going to start to fatigue themselves. So once again, we only estimate one rep max. We do that by coming up with a maximal effort of between six to 10 reps, and we do it that the individual, like it's their absolute heaviest that they can lift, okay? And if it takes more than five attempts to get to that number, please rest, come back about 48 hours later. So, other ways to look at um, training time is how long you're actually in the gym, okay? So how long it takes you to do a program is going to be dependent on how many exercises you're doing, how many sets, how many repetitions, how long you rest. All of these different components will determine how long your workout takes. Tempo, so how fast you lift, is also important. It's very important to note that a beginner, we want them to be lifting their concentric phase, their lifting phase, their work phase. Their concentric phase should last for approximately two seconds, and their lowering or eccentric phase should also last for about two seconds, okay? So we don't want to do anything extreme with beginners. We don't want to do super slow tempo or super fast tempo. Advanced individuals are the ones that will play around with tempo. So they might try to do more explosive lifts where they're lifting up faster or really drawn out slow lowering phases. So um, beginners though, two second tempo, two seconds up, two seconds down. In general, most people, we really don't want their session lasting much longer than an hour. You know, if they're extremely highly motivated resistance training and hypertrophy people, that's fine, so it's not bad to, but for your average population, create programs or classes that are an hour or less. So when we're also programming, we want to make sure we're keeping in mind with muscle balance. So we figure out muscle balance, first of all, using combination of our compound or multi-joint. So compound exercises are multi-joint exercises. 
or else single set or single joint exercises can be selected. You want to balance muscle size and appearance and you also want to make sure symmetrical. So right to left side, front to back, upper body to lower body. Anytime I program for the upper body for a general program, I always, for every front of the body exercise I create, I come up with a back of the body exercise. Symmetry is very important. So now you've done your workout. So you've had the individual warm up. You've done their cardiovascular training. You've done your resistance training. Now we need to cool down. So during the cool down, our point, our purpose of the cool down is to allow the body temperature to decrease. What we actually do for the cool down is usually similar kind of movement. So if you've been running, you slow down to a walk or else if you've been doing aerobics, you're going to slow down the size and the movement. So everything becomes smaller. And because we're allowing everything to become smaller and littler movements, this is going to allow our heart rate and our blood pressure to return to normal levels. So we're, we're dialing back that intensity of the exercise so that the heart rate could start to lower and return to normal. When this is happening, we'll be flushing lactate out of our muscles. Um, by doing a cool down, it may help reduce delayed onset muscle soreness. So delayed onset muscle soreness is the soreness you feel a couple days after activity. Um, and then there's also, we can use a cool down to enhance flexibility and induce relaxation. So usually, so we, we've done the workout, we're now cooling down the body with smaller movement. We're allowing the heart rate to lower. We're doing smaller movement to avoid venous pooling or blood pooling. Okay, so once everything kind of calms down, this is a great transition time to go into flexibility training. And we do flexibility at the end of the workout or after, if we're not doing resistance training, after the aerobic component of the workout. Because this is when the, jo the joints are going to be nice and warm, the ligaments, the tendons, and the muscles are going to be warm, allowing for greater flexibility gains. So flexibility itself is defined as the range of motion around a gr joint or a group of joints. So how much movement can you gain from that joint? And each joint will have a specific and safe range of motion. So things that will determine how much flexibility you have will be the structure of the joint. So if you think about your elbow joint, you could see that you could only extend or straighten your elbow so far. The reason you cannot extend it beyond, usually a straight line, some people could go a little bit beyond, is because of the structure of the joint itself. The olecranon goes into the olecranon process. You cannot straighten your arm anymore. So the structure of the joint will make difference. If you compare your shoulder joint to your hip joint, they're both ball and socket joints. But you can't move your hip joint that much just because of the structure of it. In comparison to your shoulder, you have such a large range of motion. Other things that will affect this about affect your flexibility is muscle size or bulk. Muscle does not make you inflexible. So when people go, oh, look at those bodybuilders, they're so inflexible. Absolutely not true. In fact, those individuals tend to be quite flexible. What can cause a problem, though, is that if you get to the point where your, your um, bony lever is running into muscle, that causes a problem. So let's pretend you have very, very, very large bicep muscle you'll only be able to flex or bend your elbows so far before your forearm will run into the muscle. So it's not like you became inflexible because you lifted weights, but rather the muscle itself takes up too much space. The same is true actually with fat tissue, that if you have a lot of extra body fat, it'll limit how far you can move before you run into another body part. Contractile properties, so we'll talk a moment in a moment about uh, your stretch reflexes. So we have these reflexes that limit stretch, especially when stretch has been done quickly. So those contractile properties will limit it. How elastic your ligaments, tendons, and fascia are. So if you have inflexible tendons, ligaments, um, you won't be able to have very much flexibility. Ligaments, remember, they go from bone to bone, and, and what their role is, is to actually limit movement. You know, we have ligaments on the medial and lateral side of our knees to prevent our knees from moving medial and lateral. That's not a desirable movement, right? So ligaments are there usually to prevent some movement. 
gender. There are gender differences between men and women when it comes to flexibility. Uh, for example, um, women tend to have more flexible hamstrings. Men are more flexible um, on doing like their leg extension. They have more flexibility through leg in extension. In general, women tend to be a little bit more flexible than men. Genetics. Um, genetics is what's going to determine these other things. So genetically, if you are born with very lax ligaments, so flexible ligaments, you're going to have greater flexibility. You might also have greater instability and be more prone to injury. Also, the joint shape, if the joint shape is simply different on you, it might allow you to do movements other people can't. So you've seen always seen those people um, that could, um, we call it double jointed individuals. It's not like they have two joints, but rather that's just a terminology, that they are very, very flexible through some joints. Injuries can cause a change in flexibility. So if you've torn ligaments that are no longer able to stabilize the joint, then you might exp ex um, experience greater than normal range of motion, so increased instability. Other times you could have an injury that could lead a buildup of scar tissue. So maybe you've injured your ligaments or your tendons and now they're shorter as a result of the healing process. And then lifestyle. Simply put, the more active you are, the more flexible in general you are. So uh, general activity itself will help with flexibility. So why do we want to do flexibility training? Um, reduce tension in our exercising muscles. It can improve our posture, so if we're very tight, in uh, certain muscles tend to get shortened and tight, so that can negatively affect our posture, so if we stretch that out, we can improve it. We could, uh, depending if we're limited in flexibility, and we increase that, we can reduce the risk of injury and improve sport performance. Remember though, please be careful, a larger than normal range of motion does not mean a better and less risk. So once you've reached normal range of motion, then there's not benefits to going beyond the normal range of motion. Okay. And in fact, if you have experience abnormally large ranges of motion, often those joints can be unstable and it could cause problems. So stretching. To really understand stretching, we do have to understand our stretch reflexes. So we have in our muscles um, something called our muscle spindles. They're called muscle spindles. And what these do, they're embedded within the muscle itself. And when you stretch a muscle, you will also be stretching these muscle spindles. These muscle spindles will react to the speed of stretch. So if you stretch the muscle really quickly, you're going to cause a reflex loop to the spinal cord. So if you stretch that muscle quickly, the muscle extends quickly, it activates these muscle spindles, and the muscle spindles send a signal to the spinal cord, which in turn sends a signal back, causing the muscle to shorten. Okay, so if you stretch the muscle too quickly, a reflex loop from the muscle spindles will cause the muscle to shorten. You've actually seen this. When you go to the doctor and the doctor uses that little hammer um, by your knee, what the doctor is actually doing is he's uh, checking your patella tendon reflex. But what that reflex does, he hits you with the hammer and he's actually hitting you on your tendon, which is going to cause an extremely rapid stretch to your quadriceps. Not a large stretch, but a rapid stretch. As a result, the, you, there's a reflex loop that goes to your spinal cord. Your quadricep muscles will contract and your leg kicks out. Okay, so you extend your knee. That is your stretch reflex. That's an extreme example. We will have this happen to us though. So if you stretch rapidly, so speed matters, it causes the muscles to contract and it does that to protect it. So essentially the muscle spindle goes, whoa, 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 we're stretching way too quickly, contract, protect yourself. And it's that it's done that way so you don't tear your muscles. But there's a very important message and take home message with this is that when we do stretching, we need to go stretch very, very slowly and progressively. So we move slowly, we hold the stretch, we breathe, and then you'll feel that muscle relax, allowing you to go for farther. That's you overriding your stretch reflex, okay? 
And so, um, yeah, if you, when you stretch, we need to stretch slowly so the muscle spindles do not contract and shorten our muscle. Now, this one um, is mentioned here. It's not necessarily specifically with stretching. It's used a little bit, the concept is used a little bit in PNF stretching, which we'll talk about in a moment. This is the opposite. So I want you to think of this as the Golgi tendon organ. It has been called the in inverse stretch reflex. This one does not deal with length of the muscle per se. What this reflex does is it will actually measure the amount of force the muscle is generating. So if the muscle is generating very high forces, we have another receptor that's called our Golgi tendon organ, our GTO, and that, that Golgi tendon organ will cause a loop, firing loop pattern with a reflex that will cause the muscle to relax. So if there's too much contraction, it will cause the muscle to relax. It is doing that so that we don't damage our muscle from having the muscle contract so strongly. Now, you've actually um, seen this probably in your own lives. When, I'm sure when you were younger, you've seen individuals that are jumping off something. So they, they climb up on something and they jump off it. When they jump and as they land, their muscles are having to contract very forcefully in an eccentric muscle action. And so they have to contract to stop themselves from hitting the ground, right? So you jumped off, you land, your muscles contract to keep you from falling. Eventually those individuals would kind of get more and more confident. They climb to higher and higher levels. And then you'd see somebody, they go to jump off something and they land, they pause for a second, and then their legs buckle beneath them and they fall to the ground. What you actually saw was the Golgi tendon organ. So you saw them having to contract their muscles so quickly and powerfully, okay, so they had to contract powerfully, that it caused the Golgi tendon organ to relax their muscles and therefore they fell. In strength training, this is very important reflex because we actually, with strength training, find a way to override this reflex. So if I go to lift, do a bench press, and I go to lift a super, super heavy weight, and I'm trying to push the bar off my chest, and it's very, 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 very heavy, and I stimulate my Golgi tendon organ so it perceives that the, the contraction is too great for me to handle, it will cause me to relax my muscles and drop the bar on myself. With strength training, we're able to override the Golgi tendon. So it works the opposite. So a muscle spindle will measure the speed of stretch. If the stretch is occurring too fast, it has the muscle contract to protect itself. The Golgi tendon organ will measure the strength and the force of a contraction. And if that strength or force of contraction becomes too high, it will have the muscle relax. So stretching itself. There are different types of stretching. There is static stretching, and that is a, a type of stretch that you hold. So you would do the stretch, go into the stretch position and simply hold the stretch. Dynamic, which is a range of motion. So on this one, you're thinking about um, shoulder rolls, um, lunging side to side, hugging the knees into the chest and moving. It's actively moving. You're moving through that range of motion. There's also ballistic stretching. With that is that really powerful bouncing jerking stretch. And then there's something called PNF stretching, which is a proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. So with static stretching, um, truthfully, this is not a picture of an individual stretching. I'm not sure why it's added here. This is not a stretching exercise, what she's doing. But with static stretching, picture any stretch that you go into that you hold. So you stay there, you feel that, that gentle pulling, and you maintain that stretch. So each muscle is gradually stretched with steady pressure. Okay, We hold it anywhere, usually 20 to 30 seconds, but it could be as low as 10 seconds, up to a minute. Uh, this is done very, very slowly. So remember, we're doing it slowly so that we do not have the muscle spindles fire. So we would hold the position, sort of as we kind of feel the stretch lessening, we'd lean a little bit deeper into the stretch, we would hold it. Okay? 
we usually perform it two to three times and you do it until you feel a stretch. So it should be a pain-free range of motion. Everything done slowly, everything done gradually. There's two types. One is an active static stretch. The other one's a passive static stretch. In an active stat static stretch, the muscle is going to have to contract while being stretched. So you're holding a stretch position using the strength of the muscle being stretched. Often done in yoga, this is common yoga poses, but let's picture, um, easiest way to picture this is imagine standing up and you bend over to touch the toes. Okay, so you're bending over to touch the toes to stretch. If you do not contract your hamstrings, which you don't have to think about doing, it'll automatically happen, but if your hamstrings were not contracting, you would fall over. Right, it's those those hamstrings have to contract to keep you from folding in half, and from you actually falling over. So they are actively contracting, so kind of technically resisting the stretch. Statics or active stretching will actually result in a longer muscle. So there will you'll actually increase the number of sarcomeres in the muscle. This is done in contrast to a passive stretch. In a passive stretch. We usually think of either using equipment or a partner to passively hold the stretch. So now imagine lying down on your back and lifting one leg in the air and having a partner hold your leg up in the air to stretch the hamstring, the back of your leg. That would be a passive stretch. A passive stretch results in what we call viscoelastic relaxation. So it actually simply relaxes the muscle. The muscle does not become uh, physiologically longer. Okay, so it doesn't add sarcomeres in length. All it does is release tension in the muscle. Once again, active stretch, the muscle needs to actively contract. The muscle that's being stretched is actively contracting. Passive stretch, the muscle is just relaxing. An active stretch will result in a longer muscle because you'll have more sarcomeres in length. A passive stretch will just result in a relaxed muscle. They just comment that... Um, a disadvantage arguably with passive stretching is that you can get injured in the sense that if your partner doesn't know what they're doing. But you could actually also passive stretch on your own. You could have that leg in the air and use a band or something to hold it in place. Dynamic stretching. We do dynamic stretches in the warm-up. So I actually mentioned it when we talked about um, warm-ups. So once we've moved around a little bit, we've warmed up, we will then use dynamic stretching. So it's part of the warm-up. All it's doing is increasing your natural range of motion. We're not holding the stretches. We work through an active range of motion. The movements are done slowly and progressively increase in size. Uh, the way I all, easiest one to think of, at least in my mind, is just doing some arm circles, right? You start with a small circle. The arm circles get bigger and bigger. That is a dynamic. Dynamic stretches are not ballistic stretches, which we'll talk about next. A dynamic stretch is a safe, controlled movement through the range of motion. Ballistic stretches are different from dynamic stretches because now this is stretching in a bouncy, explosive movement. They used to do this a lot. So you used to see somebody go warm up to do um, a run and they'd rapidly bend over, swinging their body, using momentum to stretch and stretch their calves and hamstrings. This is not very good. This has been shown to cause um, trauma to the muscle and tendons. It, uh, it could cause slight tearing. And the other thing, we just talked about mus muscle spindles. This is counterproductive to stretch, and if you think about it, because if I'm doing a ballistic stretch, I am rapidly stretching my muscle, which what did I just tell you would happen? If I rapidly try to stretch my muscle, my muscle spindles are going to fire. If they fire, they in turn are going to shorten the muscle momentarily. They're going to cause it to contract. So it's not a very um, productive way of stretching. Ballistic movements are something different. So if you're moving ballistically, that would be doing kind of a bouncing movement. That's not a stretch. But a ballistic stretch is not recommended. I To overly simplify it, I always think ballistic is bad. Ballistic, bad. 
um, because in the sense of stretching, it's not an effective way to stretch. The last type of stretching is proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. This is PNF stretching. This is outside of uh, your scope um, as a Manitoba Fitness Council um, leader. So what I will say about it though, um, this is a type of stretching that you have a partner help you with. That is, you will contract the muscle and then relax the muscle. So you contract the muscle isometrically against resistance and then you relax and stretch the muscle farther. Um, when we talked about the Golgi tendon organ, that's part of the argument or the hypothesis on why PNF stretching works. PNF stretching is a very effective way of stretching, but you need a trained individual because you really have to be careful that they know what they're doing. So stretching itself, how often, uh, if you're doing passive stretching, you actually do really have to do passive stretching every single day because the benefit you get from passive stretching, so remember that's an assisted stretch, the muscle not actively contracting a stretch while stretching, a passive stretch is simply going to relax the muscle and that relaxation will last for about 24 hours. Regardless of the type, you're going to do the stretch to the point where the stretch is felt, but there's no pain. It is in a pain-free range of motion. Time, usually we go 10 to 30 seconds. You're going to find older individuals or deconditioned individuals, they won't tolerate long durations of stretches. They, they, they'll do better if you have them stretch for a shorter length of time or hold the stretch for a shorter length of time. As they adapt to stretching, they can hold that same stretch for longer. It's a little confusing when it comes to stretching because you will come across different recommendations. Some will say, oh, only hold for 20 seconds, and they'll say 30 seconds, no hold for a minute, and you get this fluctuation. What I've come across in the research, the general consensus is that each muscle group should be held for a total of one minute. You need to determine how you're going to get that one minute. So you could do it would be a lot, but six repetitions of 10 seconds or three repetitions of 20 seconds, two repetitions of 30 seconds, or a single hold of a minute. But kind of general consensus is looking at the total time for each muscle group being stretched is one minute is what we're looking for. What, do you, which, what activity do you do? We really want to focus on muscles that we used in the um, activity and as well as muscles that are known to be stiff or tight. So postural muscles, um, we tend to be very tight in our hip flexors because we sit down so much. So our psoas and our, quad, our um, rectus femoris tend to be tight, so we want to stretch those. We tend to be tight through the pec major minor because of our posture. Again, we want to make sure we stretch those. And you also just, in general, I when I'm creating a stretching program, I hit all the major muscle groups and then I focus on the problematic ones. So how can a fitness leader measure the intensity of cardiovascular and resistance training? This we could be, for cardiovascular, um, we will be talking about percentages of uh, maximal heart rate. We'll be talking about rates of perceived exertion. We could be using the talk test. When it comes to resistance training, that is going to be a percentage of one rep max. So how many, um, how much weight they can actually lift. What are the two types of warm-ups that are completed in a fitness class? That would be a general warm-up, which is just general movement, and sports specific, which is rehearsal and specific movement to the activity that you're going to have. Benefits of both, the general warm-up simply gets the body warmed up ready to move, whereas sports specifics allows us to rehearse and prepare for the activity that's going to be completed. And the difference between static, dynamic, ballistic, and PNF stretching in the simplest terms, static stretches are a held stretch. They are done at the end of the workout. Um, best time to really do them is if it's a workout that ends with um, aerobic exercise, so do it when the body's nice and warm. And we hold the stretch, looking to gain a total of a minute. The dynamic stretching, that is range of motion, active movement. That's done through that full range of motion. This is done at the end of the warm-up. So as we're preparing our body for activity, ballistic stretching is that bouncing, jerking kind of movement. This is very, very hard on the muscles and tendons. It works count. It 
will stimulate our stretch reflex, causing our muscles to contract. It's not a recommended form of stretching. And finally, PNF stretching, proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. This will utilize usually a partner. It is beyond our scope, but this would be a contraction with a relaxation stretch. So they'll alternate between contraction and relaxation. Thank you.